Welcome to another Retro Games Development Coding video. In this video I'm going to cover how I started with an idea for a game and developed the code with a unified behavioural testing strategy. This code development and testing strategy allows me to prototype the behaviour of the code that I want first and then target those test cases with efficiently written and well-designed code. These test cases can then be used as a basis for future regression and integration test cases to lower the amount of manual testing that I need when I implement the finished product. This also gives me confidence that any code changes that I make will still work according to the test scenarios and also allows me to cover things like performance testing of the code. So how, for example, do I go from an idea to finished code? In this case, the idea was that I wanted to do some kind of game which was a, a little bit like Citadel by Martin Walker because it was a great inspiration for me when I was actually growing up in my later teenage years in trying to become a games software developer. So I had this idea that I wanted to have a top-down scrolling kind of maze navigation type of game which you can see an early demonstration build here and to accomplish this I needed to have various different technical components completed and one of the significant technical components beyond doing all of the, the scrolling and the sprite multiplexing and the sound effects and everything else and the tape and disk loaders and the cartridge code, which is all basically a solved problem because all of this code I built up already as part of earlier games development work on uh, the Berserk game and, and also the uh, Seok uh, re-engineering of the uh, entire CO engine to provide much better performance. Uh, the last significant component was actually wondering whether or not I could get a realistic maze solving algorithm implemented on the Commodore 64 to the complexity that I needed to be able to provide or fulfill the criteria or the requirements for the game. You can see here that the most part, the, the scrolling mechanism with the sprite multiplexer worked really well, but getting the enemies to move around realistically, this maze, with some quite complex maze solving algorithms was, was my last hurdle. Because the maze solving functionality was going to be really quite complex, I wanted to make sure that I developed the code in an efficient way, but also in a way which ensured that the code was behaving correctly and within the performance characteristics that I needed to be able to fit within the rest of the game. To do this, I decided to use my BDD 6502 based framework. This framework utilizes a, a methodology called behavior driven development testing, which is where test cases are actually described in terms of basically English language test cases like this example test case shows where you specify some setup criteria the usage of whatever you're testing and then you test expected output results but because the test cases are expressed in terms of an English language that can be readily understood it's a lot more maintainable I find 
and it allows you to create test cases which express the behavior that you want and it, and it allows you to iterate on the design of what you want to accomplish without getting bogged down in writing the wrong code and then iterating on the wrong code and going down uh, diversionary paths or, or disappearing down a rabbit hole, for example. So this web page by uh, the Cucumber team describe what is BDD in a lot more detail. But even though I'm working on this as a solo project, it still helps me to target the code that I want to write to test cases which have already been written. So I started writing the test cases for the functionality that I needed to see within the game. And the first test cases looked like this. I will zoom in a little bit so it's a little bit more readable. So this starts off with a feature file and then a short description about what it is. And then I started to map out each individual scenario. Now I iterated on these scenarios. Actually, I started out, I think, with uh, something like this, which is where I, I spec'd out a very simple maze with a start position here. This is the start position. And then this is the target position. As you can see here, I've got this maze and a starting point at and a target point X. Self-explanatory, right? The unit plots a route. And then the test case validates that the cheapest route is going to be down, down, right, 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 right. And then up, up down, down, right, 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 and then up. Uh, how many rights? One, two, three, four, five. Because we go down. One, two, three, four, five, and then up two. And this is the expected criteria for the maze solving algorithm is that it will have a number of iterations to try and find this route because I knew that the maze solving algorithm cannot do the work all in one go. I knew that the maze solving algorithm would need to batch up the solve into smaller chunks of work so that I can use these smaller chunks of work as and when the Commodore 64 has enough time during its frame when it's not doing all of the other work for scrolling and maintaining the multiplexer and firing bullets, for example, and so on and so forth, and playing music and sound effects and things like that. So there's going to be some wasted time here where the code is just waiting for the next V-blank or the screen split, for example. I wanted to use the Mace Salving algorithm to batch the solving into this potentially wasted code or potentially wasted a CPU execution time, uh, but then to use it more efficiently. And this also allows the game to, if it's in a busy period, it won't spend so much time solving the maze. But if there's quite a lot of free time, for example, the player is stationary and not doing much, then the enemies are going to get a lot more time to solve their routes and they're going to move a lot more and seek out the player and then that makes the player move around and run away and then the enemies are going to have a little bit less time to do their calculations. So that's what the iterations are. And then it will also take a number of frames if you like to, to solve this. Now because this maze is, it has a very linear path, the iterations and frame count are going to be the same. However, on this maze, for example, it's got a branching point where the maze solving algorithm will start from here and then it will iterate through the available spaces until it hits here and then it starts off two simultaneous solves until it tries to get to the end point. It doesn't know which direction is going to result in the end point until it actually finds it. So here it splits into two. This is why the number of iterations is higher than the final solved frame count. 
And this is why the maximum depth is two for this maze because it's got a branch point here and it's got two maximum simultaneous solves going on. So this test case, these test case, these test scenarios define the criteria for the algorithm that I need to use within the game. And then what I did was that I implement, first of all, implemented the algorithm in Java and then Java would run these test scenarios to ensure that the code was going to work. So if I show you what the Java code looks like first, then you can see what I'm talking about. So if I go here, this is IntelliJ, it's, it's a standard Java development environment. And we start off with this maze here. Each of these step lines, if I click on the definition for this, is actually defined in two different places depending on which mode of operation, if I'm testing the Java code or if I'm testing the 6502 code, I'm going to look at the Java code. In this case, the Java code defines the syntax that you want to match within the test case, and then it has an implementing member function. And then these functions are then going into a common maze piece of code here with the Java code. And this just takes the input maze and then it populates the input maze into the solve class, which has an internal representation of the maze that it actually wants to, to solve within the grid class. Yeah, so if I go to the grid, right, we have a whole bunch of nodes and each node is a specific part of a specific, each node has a, a number of flags to detail what kind of node this is, how blocked it is, for example, uh, the travel cost of traversing over this node, whether or not uh, the node has a final direction of up, down, left and right when it's solving and so on and so forth. And this Java implementation of the code is fully tested by these test cases. Once I knew that I had the Java version of the code working for these test cases, and I knew that my algorithm was working as expected in Java, then I was able to code the implementation into the 6502 implementation, which is where I started off. Here. But to make sure that the 6502 code I was writing was targeted towards a working solution in terms of the Java code, what I did was that I implemented in this class a double execution. What I do is, is that I run both the Java code and I then run the 6502 code within the BDD 6502 framework itself because it has a full 6502 emulation class. And what this does is that it keeps on validating the internal state to make sure that the internal state of the Commodore 64 code matches the state of the Java code. And the Commodore 64, the, the 6502 code, has specific labels which mirror the, the functionality of the Java code. And it continuously checks. So say, for example, if I go uh, back to this code here, it validates the internal state, which does a verification between the Java code and the 6502 code. It then runs uh, the steps run steps is Java code, which runs the steps for solving the maze. If I go back, it then runs the 6502 code by calling the Commodore 64 6502 emulation core. It then runs all of that code like it would run the Java code, but it runs it in 6502. And then it validates the grid data and it validates the internal state by cross-matching between the Java code and the Commodore 64 code. 
and it validates that the solved solution is, is the same as well between the Commodore 64 6502 code and also the, the Java code. And I can do this because I know that the Java code has already been validated by the test scenarios as well. And when I do this, when I execute this code in this editor here, so if I go back, there we go. what I can do is that because I'm running this in 6502 mode, because I ran, ran this earlier, I can just run, say for example, this particular scenario. If I choose to run the line or selection, it will just run this scenario. And what it does is that it assembles all of the code. You can see here, you can see here that uh, the 6502 code was being executed as part of the test case. And then at the bottom here, we can see that the 6502 code outputs the various different uh, debug information. So the test case does this for me. Uh, and then the final solution is actually validated with what the, the Java code says. And it says here that it's doing all of, the, all of the validate data and everything else like that. And then it produces a test report. And the test report basically then flags back to the execution web page here, which is a locally hosted web server. It, it flags back that all of the lines are green. If I change the test case so that I knew it would fail, and I reran the test case, then the iterations will come back as a failure here and it will say and it will report this line as red. There we go, see. And the rest of the lines are grey because it hasn't executed them because this was the failing condition here as part of the test stack. Let's undo that change because that change is not a good test scenario. Now all of the test scenarios are inside this feature file here, but there are also more complex testing scenarios. Because I wanted to have a notion of if enemies were being destroyed consistently by the player in specific areas, then the enemies would try and avoid those areas and they would try and route around where enemies were being destroyed and they would try and route around to get to the player instead. Okay, so I wanted to have some intelligence. So every time an enemy is destroyed, it increases the travel cost of a particular map square, which is what this test scenario exercises here. Now these test scenarios, they count up. So, so they imagine that a lot of enemies have been destroyed in this straight line from here to here. Now at the moment, still, the, the criteria for, for or, the, or the threshold, if you like, isn't high enough to cause the enemies to want to go around, so they will still go right, 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 right. Uh, and here, the threshold is high enough that enemies will then begin to start to root down and then right and then up again. And this is what the test scenarios here describe because the cheapest route now is down, 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 right, 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 up, 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 instead of the cheapest route being here for the same maze. And then this just validates that the cheapest route is still here. It uh, basically validates that the algorithm still works with higher costs. And again, I'm just making sure that when I set up some travel cost here, that the algorithm correctly steps through the solving step. So the, the step that the enemy will make to the target position is going to be that, for example, as it goes through the maze. And this, this is just all of the frames that I would hope to see as the maze is solved. And then there's another test scenario here, which is a very big maze. This was to, to test complexity of mazes, which are basically the Commodore 64 screens. Screen resolution, uh, screen dimension, so 40 characters across and 25 characters down in this case. And this shows that it is actually possible to, to solve quite a large complex maze within the constraints of the Commodore 64 code. Now, if I wanted to, I could run within the maze solving code here. So I, all I need to do then is just click run file. Now, this approach, using some Java code to test the algorithm and then using Java code to 
interface with the 6502 emulation core, also written in Java, is a good way to validate expected behavior and also expected performance of the algorithm. That's fine. But it means that you have to write some intermediate Java glue code to tie the syntax from the test cases back to the test case, the test scenario that you actually want to execute. That's fine. But also the BDD testing framework also has quite a large amount of pre-existing rich syntax that can be used to assemble individual or, or, combina or a combination of uh, assembly language source files all by itself without needing to add any extra Java based syntax. This is a test scenario for the random routine. The random routine is actually very short and easy to follow. So if I open up the RAND code, this is what the RAND code looks like. All it does is that it takes a seed value and it stores the seed value in the seeds then the RAND function takes the seeds, manipulates them, and then generates a, in inverted commas, random number from those seeds. So there are two functions here that I need to test to make sure that if I or anybody else updates this function in the future, that it still behaves in the expected way. So if I wanted to do that, then I can express the test case like this. So there are, there are a couple of scenarios where this scenario just executes the RAND function without setting the seed first. And what it does is that it first says that it wants a, a simple overclock 6502 based system. And then it runs the command line which uses the Acme assembler. It could use any assembler, it doesn't really matter. To assemble the source file into a program file. And then it loads the program file, it loads the debug output labels as well. And then it executes the procedure at RAND for no more than 20 instructions. And it expects the register to equal EA and it expects the register A to then to equal 47 for the next call. Calling it again returns back in A again uh, the value A4 and DB. And it should take no more than 20 instructions to, to do that test. And if I wanted to also then test that the seed function was working correctly, then this second scenario does that. It tests RAND with seed. And it compile, it assembles the same source file into the kind of the same program file. It loads them up, but this time it sets registers before calling seed. And then it makes sure that RAND produces expected results with the expected number of instructions. This is basically a functional behavioral test with some performance test criteria added as well. And if I run this test, it goes off and it, it assembles the output and then it runs the two scenarios and it says that they're passed. And we have a nice green test case here. And I do the same, for example, for the memory, dynamic memory handling. So the enemy movement and the maze solving is all integrated with a dynamic, dynamic memory environment. And each time an enemy requests for a route, it goes off and it runs the job of solving the, the route for the maze. And then once the job is finished, it will then put the solved movement into a dynamic memory block so that then the enemy can then execute this movement over the next few frames. Now, enemies will simultaneously move around the map. You can see that a lot of them are moving around here. And all of these movements are stored within the dynamic memory system. And then once they finish moving, it frees that dynamic memory block and it allows it to be used by other enemies. Oops, I collided with one there. I can also shoot them like, oops, like so. Uh, there's quite a lot of debug shooting going on here. Now, this dynamic memory routine, I also wanted to make sure that it was working. So again, I followed the same kind of model where the memory code is implemented as just straight Java code, which is implemented as 
part of the actual class itself. So it, it implements, it's got a buffer and it checks the heap, for example, to make sure that the, that the heap block lengths are consistent and expected. And the algorithm, because it was implemented as Java first, it was easier to, to implement and to debug and to target the code to the test case first. And, and then again, after that was done, then the same test scenario is then implemented in 6502. And again, it validates the 6502. For example, it, 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 it uh, sets up, what it does is that it checks to make sure that the execution of the 6502 code internally in the emulator matches again the execution of the Java algorithm, Java based algorithm, or Java implemented algorithm rather. And again, it's the same kind of model as the maze solving algorithm because it was a successful way of implementing, you know, uh, relatively complex. 6502 code. Now, the advantages that I have of this kind of model uh, should be pretty much obvious, but basically it means that I have a bunch of test cases that define the execution criteria and the execution behavior of all of these different algorithms. And then if I optimize the algorithms or if I uh, accidentally make some changes to the code, then these test cases will find out if there are any problems with the changes that I make to the code. It means that when I'm developing the game, I know that I have high confidence that the code individually is, is working as expected. So if there are, are any bugs, it means that I don't have to go hunting into areas of code which I know that have been tested properly, it means that the bugs will probably exist elsewhere. Now, this model was also extended to the animation system. This animation system test case, what it does is it, it performs routine tests using uh, known data for the animation system. It creates animations at known positions with screen characters at known points for, for collision tests. It then moves the animations at known velocities. Oh, there's a typo. And in combination with screen pixel scroll values. And then it tests for animations hitting the screen collision points and animations being deleted as expected. And this animation test case here, again, has a quite a large complex background step, first of all. And this, what it does is that it assembles up the animations stub source file. It then loads all of this, well first of all it populates some screen data with some characters to collide with. It then executes the procedure. It checks to make sure it doesn't take too many instructions but also importantly it expects the cycle count to be no more than 80 cycles. This is 6502 based cycles. It then checks to make sure that the animation internal memory tables contain expected data after they've been cleared, for example. It then executes some procedures functions for finding a free animation slot. And it checks to make sure that the output, that the result, the behavior of the algorithm is such that it validates that it's behaving correctly. So in this case, I want the register x to equal zero. I want the status register to have carry clear. And I expect to see that animation flags, the first animation flags is still equal to zero, for example. I then execute the procedure for initializing the animation, the returned slot for the animation. I then initialize it with a, with a specific type. All of this type code here is, is set up by the animation stub function. So if I go down to here, you can see that I have set up a whole bunch of, or a couple of 
animation types here. There are two animation types, animation data zero and animation data one. Th this is just basically a couple of stub types to make sure that the animations are being created correctly. And it's, it's known data in should equal known data or state out. This is what the test case keeps on validating. So this background task here, which executes before every scenario, to every test scenario, just validates to make sure that the internal state of the animation, initialization, and also initialization of some known enemy animations is consistent with, with what I expect. And then I can run each individual test scenario. So what this test scenario does here is that it makes sure that after the background state, after the background portion has been executed, which sets up all of the expected start positions for a couple of enemies, it then sets the the movement speeds for the four different enemies here in the X and Y direction. It also sets up some screen scroll velocity. It then calls update sprites, which then validates to make sure that the four different enemies have updated their positions as I would expect by updating the values inside the data tables in memory. And I keep on doing this to make sure that the en enemies keep on moving. They might not be enemies, actually, they might be, um, they might be bullets or explosions or something like that. Let's go check. Oh, okay. So the animation, the animation frames cycle around. Uh, they collide with the characters on the screen, and they are a pickup type. So in this case, uh, because it's flagged as pickup type, then the logic for the animation routine will basically kill the objects once they collide with some background characters. Logic, that's the expected behavior. So these animations will move around. The hex dump here is just basically so I can see what's going on in the memory, but I'm also validating uh, the, the output from the memory as well. Here. So it keeps, on, it keeps on executing the update sprites function, and it's got some criteria here for the number of instructions that it should be taking. And it keeps on updating the values. Now here, this is where it gets interesting. The the zero and the two indexes for the animations that are currently being executed go from on-screen positions to FF, which is an off-screen position. In other words, the, the animation has been killed for this particular representation. This means that the animation has detected it has collided with the screen characters and it has deleted the animation at this point now i've set up the test case in such a way that this is the expected behavior given the start positions given the locations of the characters on the screen which are defined here and the number of iterations of calling the update sprites function so this is expected and this is why I'm validating that, that the Y position contains this information. It keeps on up iterating on calling update sprites each frame, if you like, and eventually another animation will collide with the background characters and it will also turn itself off. And then here, the last animation slot will also collide with the character and it will also report that then the animation has been killed by setting it to off-screen position FF. And this is basically the test scenario validating to make sure that all of this relatively complex functionality is operating as I would expect. And then the last thing that it does is that it makes sure that it takes all of these iterations, it take, checks to make sure that they don't take longer than 10,557 cycles. This is my performance check of the code. If I make a mistake in optimizing the code, which would then in dramatically increase the number of cycles, then this line here would flag that as an issue. 
If I make a good optimization change, then I will gradually reduce this to match the new observed optimization, as long as all of these behavioral criteria are still satisfied by the test case, of course. Now I've got another test scenario here, which does the same when scrolling in the Y position. And I have another test case where it just scrolls in the X direction at speed three. So these different speeds of scrolling the screen basically cause the uh, animations and the different animation slots to hit the characters at different times. And I make sure that the different iterations of update sprites still take no more than a certain number of instructions. So you can see here that update sprites for this one takes more instructions because it's doing something extra which was which was part of the expected behavior of the algorithm. So you can see here when it's running a larger number of enemies or when there is a, a collision, for example, it will take a different amount of time for the expected number of instructions. This might be because the uh, animation frames loop around. It might be because the X position crosses over the most significant bit, for example. There, there may be various different reasons for this. But when I run this again, I run this, you can see that all of the output debug contains all of the execution history for, for the code as well. So I can actually debug this quite easily if there is a problem. I can trace back through to see what the register is contained and so on and so forth. Doing this makes it a lot easier to bug test and to bug fix code when it runs in isolation rather than trying to bug fix this code when it's integrated as part of the full game. The advantage of using this lower level syntax is that I don't need to write any extra additional Java code to assemble and then test the behavior of the assembly code that I'm writing. It allows me to test it in isolation and it allows me to test it in a lot more efficient and, and it allows me to test it a lot more efficiently and a lot quickly than the vice emulator because this is a simple overclock 65502 system it runs a 6502 code extremely quickly so the great thing about this remote debugger is that i can also use it to connect to vice when it's emulating the code i'll just assemble up and run a copy here so i'm just starting vice here with the remote debugger connection available and then I connect to the vice session with the remote debugger window here and of course it stops the execution as you would normally expect and what I can do is that I can set up a break on maze solve step maze solve step is the work function which does a step of maze solving I then just click go now, I then go into the game, and then quite early on, it has stopped. I'm going to make this window a little bit... Oh, I can't do that at the moment because it's, it's stopped on a break point. But if I click go, and then click go again, and then click go again, it's doing quite a lot of steps at this particular moment in time. Let's uh, delete the break point and then go. There we go. Okay, so what I'm going to do first is that I'm going to change the VIC settings so that we are on normal borders. There we are. And then I'm going to set a breakpoint on maze and solve step. Okay. There we go. Now, maze solve step. Once the vice emulator starts running that code here, you can see in the source level debugging that it's gone into maze solve steps. And what it does is that it goes to JSR FIFO size. I can 
step over, I can it does a compare. It checks to make sure that things aren't empty. If it's not empty, it removes one of the FIFO buffer pieces of memory or it 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 removes the, the it removes the entry in the FIFO buffer. And then it sets that for the maze solve. It then starts doing all sorts of maze solving work. It's considering another node in this code example. Of course, I can intermix it with disassembly. I can intermix it with dump. I can do a memory view of the entire Commodore 64's memory. All of this is extremely rich debugging. I can see all of the contents, all of the labels at their current state as it's executing the code as well. So I can quickly, at a glance, see the contents of the maze solving. And if I click on all of the labels, it, it expands the window. If I click on the labels which are currently being used, then it changes the view and so on and so forth. So I can very quickly and easily debug issues when the code is actually running in the game itself. I can step up, and there we go. It's, it's finished the maze solve step. Now this area of code here is part of the waiting for the, the top IRQ to be flagged as done. And if the top IRQ hasn't been done, then what it does is that it runs the maze solving calculations. So it's executing the maze solving calculations at roughly, probably, um, at these points down the screen here as it's waiting to do the next frame. So I can delete that breakpoint. I can then continue going. What I can do is, of course, I can, of course, break the game wherever I like, and I can ins inspect the code as it's, as it's executing. So I can step out, step out, there we go. I can uh, show a history of the execution, bink. It's getting the last 500 instructions at the moment, which takes a little bit of time but it then also has like an indented view of all of the history of the execution. I can see where interrupts happen. I can see where the interrupts return. I can then see where it starts executing code outside of the interrupt again, inside what we call the main line, usually. We can see all of the, the, the stack position and everything like that. It's very, very useful, this, this debugging tool. What I can do is that I can view the characters. These are the character sets. I have a character set here for the title screen and the score panel. Uh, I should have a character set somewhere down here as well. There we go. This is the character set for the level. I can also view the screen data. So if I remember rightly, the screen memory is out of the character set here. And then the character set itself is at C00. And there we go. And there we go. So the great thing about this BDD6502 framework is that if I really do have trouble trying to diagnose what the issue is just by looking at this execution history here, as it executes the test scenario, what I can do is this. enable the remote debugging and I can wait for the first 
debugger command and this is going to be the debugger connecting and then issuing a break command to hopefully stop the execution before it starts getting to animation clip. So when I run this test scenario now, it says waiting for debugger command. If I connect to this with the remote debugger, here we are, there is the remote debugger window. You can see here that it started a breakpoint at animation clear, which is what we expect because the test scenario says to run the animation clear function. So that's great. And what we can do is that if I do step over, you can see here that it's starting to execute the code in the framework itself. So every time I do a step over, it executes that it's just execute. It, it outputs that it's executed yet another instruction. And we can see here that the animation clear function is doing, you know, what we expect. But if we wanted to, we can debug it using the disassembly view. Uh, we can do all sorts of other stuff to inspect this and to try and diagnose the issue if we have one within the code we can see here it's running quite well so if i click go it just continues on running i can hit well if i had been quicker i could have hit break and interrupted one of the other test scenarios as it was executing but as it is i didn't need to so you can see here that the whole test all of the test scenarios were actually succeeded and we can see that they succeeded because it says five scenarios passed with no failures and 735 test steps succeeded with no failures. So this remote debugger is great. It can connect to the BDD6502 framework. It can also connect remotely to the VICE emulator as it's running. This is a very comfortable development experience. So thank you for watching this video. If you like all of this uh, crazy retro development stuff that I've been working then please do click on the like or subscribe button or add a comment into the comment section below. Take care and have a great day.